having conversation. So what's going to happen after this chapter? Well, one, I'm not going to be here next week, so no class next week. I told Pastor Court, right, don't need to teach Bible class. And I think looking at the forecast, he'll probably be, yeah, it'll be too hot. So you just want to leave anyway after church. So that's fine. Um, then I think when we come back, we'll probably end up doing an introduction to the next 33 through 30. We'll probably end up doing an introduction to the next section because it's, um, we're not going to be able to do a chapter a week, but you're not going to want to do a chapter a week because you're not going to be so anxious to get through all this judgment oracle because it's good news. So you're going to have lots of gospel and we can dwell richly in that, right? Not be in a big hurry. I mean, where do you got to go? I, I do post the videos online. Feel free in all your free time to watch the videos at college. Gabe's going to college in the fall. Concordia St. Paul. So, no. I guess. Ethan's going back to school. Boo. He's not here. Oh, that's too bad. Boo. All right. Mike's here. Patrick. No whining, okay? Thank you. All right, so let's start. Uh, first, let's pray. May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. That was our psalm for last week, right? Good. So, uh, this is an oracle, although King James, does ESV do the same? Uh, yep, they both call it a lamentation, a, a lament. Yeah, usually lament is over something that you've lost, right? So you lament over things that you, well, arguably God has taken from you, right? And so then you turn that, don't do that to your cup, Weston. Don't squeeze your cup. Um, but here it's a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Uh, would we lament over Pharaoh, king of Egypt? This is probably a helpful thing to say now so I don't forget to say it later because I do intend to which is that while we, we, we kind of we have a double response to judgment against unbelievers, all right? Um, so for, we, we, we do want recompense. We want judgment. We want God, the Lord's word to be vindicated. And we don't mind people going to hell, especially if there are personal enemies, right? Um, and some of that's guilt, right? Our own sinful nature at work. Um, but on the other hand, I think like, we wouldn't want somebody who's an unbeliever, but who's somebody who we love, a family, a friend, or a neighbor, um, to be condemned to hell, right? So there we lament over even the death of the wicked, right? Because probably, I mean, often, or maybe, these are going to be people that are actually near and dear to us in this life, right? And so that is worthy of a lament. So maybe that's the way to understand what's going on here with this lament. Yes, Pharaoh, we've talked about, has been like an icon of, well, of Satan, um, but also of Egypt being the place of slavery and bondage, right? Um, and so for that, of course, we want both Satan and, and slavery to sin and death be, to be overthrown. And we have no problem with Satan going to hell. As a matter of fact, you can tell him to go to hell. That's fine. Because <laughs> the Lord has already cursed him. So go for it, right? Um, but Pharaoh, he's a man, right? Egypt's Egyptians? Yeah. So, so there's this double response to judgment. Um, we don't... It's hard to say that we, that we should rejoice over the death of the, of the wicked. Because not even God does that. Right? He doesn't even desire the death of the wicked, but that they repent and live. So it's not like God takes some kind of sadistic pleasure in judging people for their sin. I think that's the way to say it, maybe. Or, you know, he, he, he loves inflicting pain upon them or something. Right. That's not the God we have. Although that's sometimes how it seems, maybe. <laughs> All right, so let's read. Um, let's do... So, oh, by the way, some of... Yeah, that's fine. The garbage is right over here. There's... Uh, this, this, these two oracles here are a lot of... What did I call it on the sheet? Um, I wrote it on here somewhere. It doesn't matter, Probably. It's like a recap. Oh, it reprises and elaborates on early or oracles. So we're going to hear a lot of the same stuff that we've already been hearing, if you've been with us. So not to worry too much. Oh, and one other thing that we're going to note. I want to give you a lot of introduction here today, apparently. 
um, is that you're actually going to learn a lot more about hell than what you probably knew before. Because <laughs> um, this, along with Isaiah 14, are the two places, where pretty much the only two places that there's a, a significant description of, of kind of the nature or structure of hell. All right. Or Hades or Sheol or whatever you want to call it. So let's read, and we're going to read 1 through 16. Master, just let him be. In the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, raise a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, You consider yourself a lion of the nations, but you are like a dragon of the seas. You burst forth in your rivers, trouble the waters with your feet, and foul their rivers. Thus says the Lord God, I will throw my net over you with the host of many people, and they will haul you up in my dragnet. And I will cast you on the ground, on the open field I will clean you, and will cause all the birds of the heavens to settle on you, and I will gorge the beasts of the whole earth with you. I will strew your flesh upon the mountains, and fill the valley with your carcass. I will drench the land, even to the mountains, with your flowing blood, and the ravines will be full of you. When I block you out, I will cover the heavens, and make your stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give us light. And the bright lights of heaven will I make dark for thee, and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. I will trouble the hearts of many people when I bring your destruction among the nations into the countries that you have not known. I will make many people appalled at you, and the hair of their kings shall bristle with horror because of you when I brandish my sword before them. They shall tremble every moment, every one for his own life on the day of your downfall. For thus says the Lord God, the sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon you. I will cause your multitudes to fall by the swords of mighty ones, all of them the most ruthless of nations. They shall bring to ruin the pride of Egypt, and all its multitudes shall perish. I will destroy all its beasts from beside many waters, and no foot of man shall trouble them any more, nor shall the hoofs of beasts trouble them. Then I will make their waters clear, and cause their waters to run like oil, declares the Lord God, when I make the land of Egypt desolate. And when the land is desolate of all that fills it, when I strike down all who dwell in it, then they will know that I am the Lord. This is a lamentation that shall be chanted. The daughters of the nations shall chant it over Egypt, and over all her multitude shall they chant it, declares the Lord God. Oh, so we have a new canticle for the church. Are we going to chant this in church? Yeah. yeah. They shall plunder the pomp of Egypt and... Oh, no, that's a different kind of song. We talked, that was, didn't we have the sailor songs before? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's funny. All right, let's go back to the top. All right, so um, we, some of this we've already talked about before, but it's worth recapping. First, time and date. Um, Jerusalem fell in the summer of 586, and it took the survivor about uh, six months to come to Ezekiel and inform him. So that was about January 585, which will be in the next chapter, actually. Then two months later, in March 585, we have these two oracles of judgment against Egypt. So they actually kind of happen after the fact, um, but also before. Um, and so we hear things that we've heard in the other oracles. You have probably some pretty strong indications of an accusation against Egyptian gods in particular. So Ra would be one. And what was the other one I listed? Sekhmet. Sekhmet, who has a lion head. So that there's a thing about a lion in here, right? Yeah. Um, although we don't have a lot of examples of pharaohs considering themselves lions, it may be one of the things that seems to be going on in this chapter is that Ezekiel is taking language that typically in the scriptures is appropriate to Israel, but he's applying it to Pharaoh. So when we hear oracles, when we hear judgment against Israel, he's kind of saying the same thing, but he's saying it against Pharaoh. So he's calling because we know that Jesus is the lion of Judah, right? Um, and Israel is often described as a lion in the prophets. So to have Pharaoh described as a lion may be a kind of a nod towards that, is that he's receiving the same sort of judgment that Israel did, perhaps. Uh, let's see, what else do we want to talk about before we get into it? Oh yeah, there's the lion stuff, it's all there. And then we have the sea monster stuff, right? Yeah, Ethan said dragon or dragon, dragon as they say in Sheboygan. Um, oh, there it is, it's in Sheboygan too, right? Dragon, Sheboygan, okay. You are like a monster of the seas. I think last time when we looked at chapter 31, I suggested to you crocodile. 
which uh, with, with at least one exception, but for the most part, the crocodiles were considered, they're kind of considered like, what's a beast that defiles the land? Um, okay. A skunk, yes. A hyena is skunks. Or of the air would be like bats, right? Or crows, vultures, yeah, vultures. So this is of the sea, would be like a crocodile. They just, they rip things up, they eat everything, they're, they're, and they're gross, and they're, yeah. So, but not only like a monster of the seas, but if you remember in the last chapter, a defeated monster. All right, so Pharaoh's defeated as well. He thinks of himself as the noble lion, right? And instead, you're just this beast that's wallowing Psalm in the Nile. 20, 29, I remember which verse he crushed Rahab like the carcass. Rahab is that monster. Yeah, we talk, didn't we talk about that last time? Okay, yeah. I think it's in the background here as well, because Rahab means despicable, I think. If I'm Despi- yeah, like the movie. Thanks. I think that's, I don't think it's referring to the historic figure Rahab, but rather to maybe this sea creature. Right, see how, see how that creature is bursting out of the rivers, troubling the waters, and fouling them up. So that's. Pharaoh thinks of himself as this noble leader, but in reality, he's actually brought only just grossness. And so he's actually going to get what's coming to him. (laughs) Um, You know, when the Lord says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, quoting Hammurabi or whatever, it doesn't matter, you know, um, that reciprocal justice that's talked about in the Old Testament, um, we have the same thing happen to Pharaoh. Pharaoh behaves in a particular way, so then God gives him exactly what his behavior deserves. Dorothy. All right. Is that where the notion of karma comes from? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that is what karma... I mean, that's the Eastern notion. But um, life for a life? I would suggest that as far as the law goes, that's, that's been written on our hearts since the fall. Right? And so... And then you, you end up defining mercy as not karma. That God does not give you what you deserve. You know what you deserve, but he doesn't give you that. That's mercy, right? Um, I mean, I've, I've argued... I've argued that this, there's no place for mercy in the civil estate. But on the other hand, we know that governments, judges, legislators, cops, soldiers, they don't execute justice perfectly. So there does seem to be a need for a place for mercy where a third party says, hey, look... This was, I was a corrupt judge, or that was trumped up charges, or the evidence was planted, or whatever, right? And we call that mercy, but it's really justice, but it looks like mercy because he's not getting... Thanks, Gabe. All right. So, uh, what's, we already heard this in the last chapter, so we can keep going. Um, What's the Lord God going to do? What's he, he says? He's going to spread out his net... Right? So this is all over in the Old Testament, especially Isaiah as well, that the net, you know, I mean, we have nets in the New Testament too, catching fish, right? Spreading his net. Um, but to draw into his net, in this case, is judgment. It's not good news. It's bad news. Right? And who's the net? It's all these other nations, actually. So God's going to use Babylon. But we talked about this, that there's some confusion because there's not a lot of historic evidence that Babylon ever actually conquered Egypt seems like Egypt was already on its way out. Um, But here, the suggestion from Ezekiel is that, and this comes after the word comes back, so maybe Ezekiel knows how it happened, is that Babylon conspired with others against Egypt. So maybe not Babylon directly, but Babylon through other agents are the ones who conquer Egypt. And I don't know if there's historic data for that either. Probably not. Um, But that's how the Lord, but it's actually, whose net is it? It's my net. It's the Lord's net. So he's using these nations, godly or ungodly, it doesn't even matter. He's using them to accomplish this judgment, this purpose, right? His net. And I will leave you on the land. So that's, we call that exposure, right? That was common in the ancient world. You've seen 300, you know. The Spartans did that with children that were unwanted, that kind of thing. Just leave them out, let the animals eat them or whatever. That's kind of karma too, isn't it? That's not karma, that's probably something else. 
Um, I will cast you out on the open fields, which would not be good for a great sea creature, would it? Fish out of water, right? And then I will cause to settle on you the birds of the heavens, and with you I will fill the beasts of the whole earth. So we talked about this last week with uh, Pharaoh being presented, or Egypt, was it Pharaoh or Egypt, presented as this big tree? Actually, it was Assyria, wasn't it? No, it was Egypt. It was Egypt? Yeah. All right. This uh, cosmic tree, and we talked about the tree with its roots into the earth and its boughs into the heavens, and how that is like this almost semi-divine kind of caricature. Right here, he's presented as this great crocodile that's like, it's large enough that, that he's going to feed many birds and many beasts. Right? So it's like this cosmic crocodile. That's kind of fun thought, isn't it? I like, like that. It's like the giant they killed in the Norse myths who, who was like part of the earth. He, mm-hmm. he became the mountains and all the blood yeah. became the rivers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's here too, isn't it? You like your Norse myth. Look at you. Did you read the book I bought? The the one from Neil Gaiman or Gaiman? I haven't read that yet. I read it. I was you read too, it? I was too young when you first got it. Yeah, I don't know if it's appropriate for, for you. I don't know if it's appropriate for me. I noticed. Um, He's a fiction writer, but he wrote he wrote a account of Norse mythology, but in his own voice. Do you know like um, what are the things that we uh, never never wear American gods? What's another one that he did? He loves me. Oh, yeah, the Graveyard Book. Yeah, that's for children. That's a young adult book. Anyway, famous author. Anyway, you wrote a thing on Norse. I'm sorry, distraction. Um, I will lay your flesh on the mountains. So he's large enough to be laid out, like on the mountain, right? And fill the valleys with his carcass. Right? Now, of course, Egypt is a large nation, right? So they're all going to be devoured this way. Right? And then it gets pretty gruesome, doesn't it? I will also water the land with the flow of your blood, even to the mountains, and the riverbeds will be full of you. This sounds like a massacre, doesn't it? Yeah, this takes what chapter 29 says and just uh, increases the description. Right, exactly. That's what I said. It's it's pulling on previous things that we had. All right, so we've had that before, but here it's just like, this is a pretty incredible uh, judgment. And then... This one's a little, this is a little strange, but maybe not. I will put out your light. I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. That actually sounds familiar. Joel chapter two and four, I think, if I remember right, the two chapters, which are quoted by St. Peter at Acts. We said, he talks about the day of the Lord with the moon turned to blood and the, or the sun will not give its light and said that that happened on the day of crucifixion. That's what happened at the cross is Joel was fulfilled. Well, here we have the echoes of the prophet Joel as well, right? Except the light that's being put out is not the sun, but it's actually Pharaoh, right? And all his, all those who are in league with him, which would be the fellow stars is what I would suggest is going on there, Right? And all the bright lights of the heavens I will make dark over you and bring darkness upon your land. So darkness is an obvious theme of judgment, right? No light and you die. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. We don't want the light to go out. I'm sure um, the uh, ten plagues were Mm. continually talked about uh, for future generations and so they'd be familiar with it. Yeah, so an attack on the rivers is an attack on the divinity of Pharaoh because there, that, we have that with the Nile and the ten plagues, right? Um, the darkness, the, which day was that? The, the ninth or tenth? Tenth plague was the darkness. So that's probably in the background too. That's true. I didn't, I didn't note that, but that's probably true. I think you're right. Um, but anyway, the Lord's net is going to draw up this great beast out of the river and uh, he's going to be dead, dead. Very dead. And then you're all, the, the death of Pharaoh slash Egypt is also going to bother a lot of other people, right? And we go from kind of that figurative language of this great sea monster and its death now to just pretty explicit literal language, right? So that's why New King James here changed the typesetting, right? This is kind of poetry, and then we move into just prose. You see that, right? 
I will trouble the hearts of many peoples. Um, this is what happens when Israel goes from Egypt towards the promised land. Remember when they come to Jericho, um, you know, the question is why um, Rahab would protect the spies. She's like, I've heard about you, what, your, what your God has have done to, to the king of Moab, right? Or is it just Moab? I think it's just Moab. Maybe she mentions another king too. Eglon, maybe? I don't remember which one she mentions. Right, so word gets around, and that's what happens here. Egypt is going to fall, and then word's going to get around, and the fellow nations are going to be like, well, if that happened to them, what's going to happen to to us? To us. All right. Just a little bit too fast. All right. When I bring destruction upon the nations into the countries which you have not known, I will make many peoples astonished at you. Their kings shall be horribly afraid. And then we talked about this in the last chapter, when I brandish my sword, right? So it's his net, it's the Lord's net, it's his sword, right? And we, we heard a few things here in church today about the Lord being, you know, the king of all the earth and Lord of, over all the nations, right? Um, that means he's also the, he's also the Lord of uh, the United States of America, you know? We don't like to think that God could work through an ungodly king like Joe Biden, but he does. For what purpose is ultimately always about repentance and the forgiveness of sins, right? Um, so I will make the peoples astonished. Oh, at my sword before them, and they shall be tremble, tremble, tremble. Every man for his own life in the day of your fall. Right? So that's what Jesus talks about when he talks about... <clears throat> Judgment during Holy Week, right? Go ahead. Can you go with her? Dorothy, the toilet's that way. I guess she doesn't need to go potty. Distracted. Um, remember, Jesus talks about how fear and foreboding will come, come upon you. You know, the nations um, will be perplexed with fear and foreboding, right? At what is coming upon the earth. I think that's how he says it. So when you don't want to see nations around you being judged, because the question is always going to be, are we next? Right? Are we going to be judged on the same basis? Please don't do that with the chair. All right. For thus says the Lord God, the sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon you, and then by the swords of the mighty warriors, all of them most terrible of nations, I will cause your multitude to fall. So here's another indication, I think, from Ezekiel, that Babylon is in league with other, war, with other nations. You see that? So it's Babylon's sword plus the swords of other nations. So who actually fought against Egypt doesn't even particularly matter. The point is, they're judged by the Lord, right? And they will fall. Okay? Then we go back to poetry again. Poetry, yeah, look at it. You see how it doesn't look the same, does it? They, so that's all the mighty warriors in Babylon, will plunder the pomp of Egypt. What did yours say, Ethan? Something different. Ruin the pride. Ruin the pride of Egypt. Okay, I like that. And all of its multitudes shall be destroyed, including its animals from beside its great waters. And then we have this strange thing happen here. I thought it was strange. Maybe you think it's strange. There's already a, there's going to be a restoration to Egypt of a sort. It's almost messianic, Right. For the foot of man shall muddy them no more, nor shall the hooves of animals muddy them. Then I will make the waters clear and make their rivers run like oil, says the Lord God. So this has perplexed a lot of people. It's like, wait a minute. So he's going to remove Pharaoh, but then there's a restoration coming to the land, which sounds like end time stuff, right? Yeah. We, the land has been defiled by sin, and then when God removes sin and judgment and death, then the land is restored. We have the new heavens and the new earth, right? And the rivers flowing out um, from the city of God. Um, by the way, water and oil, Christians can't help but hear this. These two things often go together in the New Testament. Some liturgical churches in the East and the West, so Rome, Eastern Orthodox, um, and some Lutherans. I actually have done this, but I haven't made a deal out of it. But I'll, I anoint my, I have, I have a little bit of oil that I anoint the child when I make the sign of the cross at their baptism. But I don't, it's not there. 
The idea, um, it's called chrism. Have you heard of this before? It's usually a fragrant oil, or it can just be pure olive oil. That's fine, too. And then the idea is, uh, because oil is often described in the scriptures as being um, the gift of the Holy Spirit, so then they're receiving the Holy Spirit in baptism. Then when they're sick or discomforted or whatnot, you could anoint them again with the sign of the cross, right? Which just connects them back to their baptism, but also um, to that gift of the, the Holy Spirit to guide them and to lead them out of their perplexity or their sickness. So anointing the sick has a long tradition from the Acts of the Apostles. It's right in the scripture. Um, I don't know why our churches omitted it. Um... Maybe because we don't have a clear word instituting it from Jesus. So it ends up being uh, what some would call sacramental, but not a sacrament. Meaning it's like a sacrament and that it, it's a sign with some words of God attached to it. But we don't have an institution from Jesus say, when you go to the sick, anoint them with oil and say these words. We don't have that. All right. But still, um, it's still... A pretty significant tradition. Of course, oil is a sign of wealth, too. Um, I don't know. Maybe it could be metaphorical as well. That oil, I don't know. How does, how does it move differently than water? It's smooth flowing, I guess. But I don't know what that metaphor would mean. But in any case, Egypt is restored and made a place with clear water and rich with oil by the Lord God. After we remove and plunder everything that has muddied it up. Right? Literally been muddied up with their feet. Follow so far? All right. So uh, maybe that's something that is important to note, is that just because uh, a, a land is judged, God does not make it, there. I mean, sometimes he does, Sodom and Gomorrah, but typically he doesn't turn the place into a wasteland where you can't dwell anymore. Sometimes he does. Right? But typically, and especially um, eschatologically, that is on the last day, all things will be made new. Even the rough places made a plain, the high place, you know, hear the language. Maybe even the Sahara becomes a lush garden again. You know, it once had rivers and trees and I mean, you can, the, the stuff's there. I don't, when did it get turned in? It's not that long ago, by the way. It seems archeologically less than 5,000 years ago. At least, I mean, at the most 5,000 years ago, probably less is when the Sahara was turned into a desert. How? How did, what, what happened there? So that, that takes a huge feat of nature. Or right, and because it, 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 it apparently was quite rapid. So, yeah, I would say it was an act of God. So what was the act of God, and for what reason, what judgment? Right, because great civilizations were there, probably. I mean, they're on ancient maps, so. Did you know about that? No, of course, they don't tell you, teach you that in school. That's why you come to Bible class. Okay, so you can learn about crazy things. So I'm going to make the land of Egypt desolate um, and destitute. That means desolate of people and destitute of the power and strength that it once had. Oh, what's going on here? When I strike all who dwell in it, and then they shall know. And this, we've heard this over and over in all these oracles of judgment. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2. Can't help it. But it's not always Lord and Savior who has delivered me from sin, death, and the devil. Sometimes it's just, you know, Lord. He's king, and he's terrible, and, he, and he's destroyed us. And we deserved it. All right, so they will know that. Okay. And we're going to lament for that, and we should lament for that. You know? We don't want to see anybody... Um, Anyone die outside of faith, right? We don't want to see any nations perish. We don't, we don't like to see misery and suffering and, you know, you know warlords sending their uh, young, young men and women into, into meat grinders and bakhmut or whatever, right? And we should lament that because it's, it's ugly and gross. All right. So let's go to the pit. How about that? <laughs> Speaking of pleasant topics, let's go, let's go to hell. How about it? Part two. Who wants to read? We haven't read this yet. The whole thing, 17 through the end? Yeah, why not? Yeah, okay. Well, read to as far as you want to read. That's All fine. Right. My voice is just not good today. Okay, I'll tell you when to stop. All right. Hang on. 17. 17. In the 12th year, in the 12th month, on the 15th day of the month, the 
the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, wail over the multitude of Egypt and send them down, her and the daughters of majestic nations, to the world below, to those who have gone down to the pit. Hmm. Whom do you surpass in beauty? Go down and be laid to rest with the uncircumcised. Ouch. They shall fall amid those who are slain by the sword. Egypt is delivered to the sword. Drag her away and all her multitudes. The mighty chiefs shall speak to them, of them, sorry, with their helpers out of the midst of Sheol. They have come down, they lie still, the uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Assyria is there, and all her company, its graves all around it, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, whose graves are set in the uttermost parts of the pit, and her company is all around her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, who spread terror in the land of the living. Elam is there, and all her multitudes are on her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword. Heard that before. Who went down uncircumcised into the world below, who spread their terror in the land of the living. They bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. They have made her a bed among the slain, with all her multitude, her graves all around it. All of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, for terror of them was spread in the land of the living. And they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. They are placed among the slain. Okay, let's stop there. Okay. Who wants to pick up there? Verse 26. There are Meshach and Tubal and all their multitudes with all their graves around it, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. They cause their terror in the land of the living. They do not lie with the mighty who are fallen of the uncircumcised, who have gone down to hell with their weapons of war. They have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities will be on their bones because of the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yes, you shall be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised and lie with those slain by the sword. Okay. There is Edom, her kings, and all her princes, who despite their might are laid beside those slain by the sword. They shall lie with the uncircumcised and with those who go down to the pit. There are, there are the princes of the north, all of them and all the Sidonians, who have gone down with the slain in in shame at the terror which they caused by their might. They lie uncircumcised with those slain by the sword, and they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. I've heard that before. Pharaoh will see them and be comforted over all his multitude. Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword, says the Lord God. For I have caused my terror in the land of the living, and he shall be placed in the midst of the uncircumcised with those slain by the sword. Pharaoh and all his multitude, says the Lord God. All right. I like how you, um, you both read it because I think you caught the poetic character of it, right? With the repetition in there. With that, it's a refrain, right? With the uncircumcised, those who call terror amongst the land of the living, who are slain, slain by the sword, right? All right. So a bunch of people groups. Um, and again, this is a pretty, uh, it's as thoroughgoing a description of hell as, as you can get. Maybe Dante wasn't completely wrong, you know, with his levels of hell. Right? Because it, it does seem to be that there's like regions. Here's the Assyrians, and here's the Sidonians, and here's the Elamites, and he, here's the Edomites, and they're distinguished. They have their own you know, luxury suites, if you like, or something like that. Uh, what date is this compared to what we saw before? I think it's about two weeks later, right? Yep. Is, is that right? Yeah, the first one was the first day of the month. Oh, yeah, day. and this is the 15th day of the month. Okay, so two weeks later, good. Right? And now, the beginning of it is a little bit hard to hear, um, but actually, in the Congregation of Prayer this week, we're going to hear a few readings about um, loosing sins and binding sins. Right? Now, loosing sins, we, we don't have any problem hearing about. I, don't, I think we still have problems doing it, forgiving sins, in other words. Right? It's hard to forgive. Uh, it's probably impossible for us to forgive, um, apart from the Holy Spirit being forgiven by Christ first. Uh, binding sins, maybe we think that's easy to do, but I th my, my experience, it's also been quite hard to say to someone, hey, look, um, you refuse to repent and you don't want to be a part of this congregation, so bye, right? And just say, find, find a church, you know, find another church, repent, believe the gospel, go in peace, I don't know what else I can do for you, right? And we're not really good at just saying your sins are bound to you and you don't want them released, so... Um, this isn't the place for you anymore. Uh, yet we're commanded actually by Jesus to do that as a church, usually exercised by way of the pastor, which is not helpful. I don't want to hear that either. John chapter 20, you'll hear it in Matthew 16, 17, and 18 in the congregation prayer this week. 
Um, it's always, we, we never bind someone's sins for the sake that they be damned, because we already talked about that. We lament over that, right? We don't want them damned eternally. Of course not. But we say your sins are bound to you until, you know, moved by the Spirit again, that you repent. So it's always for the sake of forgiveness. It's kind of like, it's not a vain threat like parents make. We're like, oh, if you don't do this, such and such is going to happen. These gentlemen know we don't make vain threats, mostly, right? Correct. Yeah, because there's no point. <laughs> if you're going to threaten something, you've got to follow through with it. Or otherwise, it's, not, it's just, what is it? It's just words, right? So, no, the punishment does follow. Um, and I think it's the same, right? If someone is living outside of faith, then you declare that to them, and you do exercise the punishment against them, right? But you're not punished in order that you would run away and abandon. No, it's always to say, oh, now I recognize the severity of what I've said or done or thought. Uh, so here we have something similar where the prophet is actually given, and we want to contrast this with what, we, what we'll see in the fo following chapters, which will be the opposite of this, where he'll be given to raise the dead. Here it's actually to damn the unbelievers. So he's actually called to speak to them and to send them by his word, to the depths of the earth. I always wonder, have you wondered about this last week or this week, that, that the ancients, Ezekiel in particular, has this notion that there's a dwelling place under the earth? Like there's, there's cavity and there's openings, there's chambers under the earth. Where did they get that notion? Obviously they had caves, but... Because it's actually true. I mean, there's a whole... Do you hear about the lithium deposit they found in Arkansas? So I'm like, how do you get lithium? So they drill down far enough, they find a huge reservoir of, of this salt brine that has lithium ions in it. So then they pump that salt brine up, and I don't know if you distill it or however you get the, the lithium ions out. I don't know if they return the rest of the brine back or not, probably not. Sounds, sounds better than strip mining, but it still... It, yeah, it was in the news a day or two ago. Yeah, it's got a huge boom for some city on the south part of Arkansas because they'll be able to pump all... Because lithium, you need a lot of lithium to make all these electric car batteries. Yeah. So, anyway, but there's this whole underground lake under this town, right? Big enough that they can... It's like a huge... It's like a gold mine, basically, because lithium's more valuable than gold, actually. So, um, who knew it was there? And so you have these ancients that are like... There's like a whole dwelling place under the earth. And is it just metaphorical? In the same way that heaven is like up here, but yeah, I suppose it is, or some kind of different dimension, I guess, is the language we'd use today from um, quantum physics. But in any case, they have this sense of there's a pit. And I suppose that, I mean, it could be metaphorical too, because you dig a pit and you throw all the stuff you don't want in it and then you bury it, right? The carcass or the, I don't know, the hunters do that, right? You bury the carcass or... Um, the refuse, right? You, you, you don't just defecate in the forest. You dig a hole first, right? And cover it up. You're supposed to anyway, I guess. Talk to your dogs about that. Do they do that? The dogs do that sometimes. Anyway. All right, so you haven't wondered about this? Fine. I just gave you some wondering. All right, so, uh, but the prophet is the one who's going to do this by the word of the Lord. So it's the word of the Lord that does it, but by way of the prophet. Can you imagine? I mean, fear and trembling, right? To actually damn someone to hell, which is what he's effectively doing here to Pharaoh. And her and the daughters of the famous nations. So there we have again, Pharaoh is in league with other people, just like Babylon was in league with other people. They're not acting alone. And who are these famous nations, these daughters? We meet some of them later on, right? We had Assyria, we have, well, we'll get to those. All right. And then you have this like kind of, uh, rhetorical statement, or not rhetorical. It's dripping with sarcasm, I think is what I wrote here. Mockery and sarcasm. Who does he think he is? Whom do you surpass in beauty? Ha! <laughs> now that you're in hell. Um, and then we have this bit about the uncircumcised. Ethan brought this up last week, and he was right. Um, Egyptian kings and princes would be circumcised, at least. It's not sure if everybody was, but at least them. Uh, many of these nations that we we're going to mention, Edomites, Elamites, um, Obviously, Israelites, but they're not mentioned. Assyrians, we talked about. The people in Tyre were being circumcised. Apparently, a lot of people were being circumcised. I just assumed it was just this weird Jewish thing, and everybody else was. No. Um, as you can learn from Gerard, and we talked about this last week, is that 
Uh, when there's a true religion, when there is, everything else is going to mimic it because they want the benefits of it, but they don't want the investment of actual faith, right? They don't want to believe it, but they want the benefits, right? So you, you, there is a way that comparative studies, um, which happen at secular universities where they compare world religions, and um, unfortunately, it, it tends to damage faith more than help faith for a lot of people, but there is a place for it where you can say, well, wait a minute, why do all these other, other religions have like myths about floods or about world trees or about the enemy's blood being rivers. And so who's mimicking who is the question, right? Um, and even, even a secular person, less secular than he used to be, um, you know, philosopher um, or psychologist, I should say, Jordan Peterson has said that the, the Bible is the Ur text is the language he uses. It's the, it's the text that the other texts are, are expounding upon or deriving from. And he, you know, he's not, uh, I, I think he's probably almost convinced of it. Uh, at least Jesus is the truth, but his, his wife is a Christian, so it helps. But his conversation with other Christians has brought him along. And part of it is, is that, wait a minute, that Christianity is the most real of the, of the religion, or it's the most true. There's something compelling about that kind of statement. But anyway, to be uncircumcised is then kind of, Maybe it's just Ezekiel's way of saying, since these nations are mostly circumcised too, but, but they're being treated as the uncircumcised would be a way to say this. All right, and I gave you a quote from uh, Revelation on here somewhere. Where did I put it? Or I refer to this in Revelation. Dun, 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 dun. Where did I put it? You know, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like dying with the un being buried with the unbaptized. You know, which for, until pretty recently, that was considered a, abhorrent. Like, you didn't bury unbaptized people in the church cemetery. Only the baptized. Only those who confess the resurrection of the dead, in other words. Right? Would be buried together. Otherwise, you're kind of desecrating all the graves by doing that. That's the notion here. It's to go down, the circumcised going down with the uncircumcised. It's like, you're being desecrated. Which, of course, you are, because you're in hell. Am I said too much? Did that make sense? Yeah, there's a quote on here somewhere. Oh, it's right there in the middle of the second, the last paragraph on the front first page. It would be similar to expressing the fate of Pharaoh as consigned to the eternal perdition among the unbaptized who are unbelievers. Revelation 20. There you go. 21. So you can go look at that. All right. So that's going to happen over and over. And then we have that, that, ant, that refrain, right? They fall by the... Oh, they'll fall into the midst of those slain by the sword. Right? We have the slain by the sword, uncircumcised, slain by the sword. They have gone down. Um, what's something else here that I was going to say? The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with those who help him. Oh, this is the song that the, that the dead are singing in hell of Egypt. They have gone down. They lie with the uncircumcised. So they're all singing together this song of death and damnation and desecration. Um, but I think I wrote on here somewhere, and we said it before, misery loves company, right? So, I mean, because you saw it at the end, Pharaoh, it said was, how did it say it? Pharaoh will see them all and be comforted. Like, wait a minute, how's that comf comforting? Well, at least I'm not the only one here. <laughs> Amongst the uncircumcised, slain by the sword. I just made the same mistakes that nations after nations have made over and over. Um, this, is, this is similar to what people do on this side of hell um, with, uh, I guess, what we call a hedonistic lifestyle. It's like everybody's doing it, the lemming thing, right? It's like, well, you know, uh, if you can't beat them, you might as well join them. When in Rome, you know, that kind of language is like, is it right or wrong? I mean, that's actually the question. Did God give you to do this? Or did he actually forbid it? Or did he leave it to your liberty? Like, those are the questions you need to ask. Not like, is everybody doing it? Like, well, you know, no, nobody's celibate until marriage anymore, so why would we need to be? Like, um, God's word? I don't know. Seems pretty so simple to me. Right? All right. Um, but they don't like that. I was like, well, that's just not the way of the world today. That's not how kids are these days, the parents say. I'm like, well, oh, yeah. And then you want to be grandma, right? And say, you know, well, if somebody told you to jump off a bridge, would you do it? Yeah. Or something like that. What? So that's right, but so, so let's say 
Is that what they say? Oh, that's, what they, that's what my grandmother probably said to me. I don't know. Uh, she, was, she was very blunt and direct, which I appreciated quite a bit. I think that's a farmer thing, maybe. All right, so let's see. Who did we miss? Who did we not talk about? Oh, Assyria. We've talked about Assyria before. Assyria predates um, Babylon. We said Assyria reigned for hundreds of years, whereas Babylon's not even going to make it 100 years as far as its reign of terror. Um, Assyria is kind of the epitome. It's not kind of. It is the epitome of, of a terrible, ruthless, tyrannical force. Second, only historically in the mind of an Israelite to Egypt. Egypt probably still has more of that. Although, as we heard from the people after they left Egypt, they kept wanting to go back. So maybe Egypt wasn't quite as terrible. <laughs> but Assyria, just notoriously bad. And there's plenty of examples in the scripture. When you hear about their conquest of the north of Israel, not, they didn't conquer Judah, but they co- conquered Israel. And what they did, um, they, de- they definitely deserved to be there. Right? Her graves are set in the recesses of the pit. So we have this kind of, now you have this mental image, right? It's this pit, and then there's holes in the wall, and that's where you put the dead. It's like a, it's a catacomb of a sort. Seems like there's been films that have recreated this. Um, now, now they're thinking about it. You know, it's like a pit with like two in the wall? Yeah, but it's not necessarily a pit. It's like they'll, wasn't there like a, probably a, a, D- a DC thing where all the people were stuck in the wall, they were all being enslaved. Well, it's like a eh, matrix, whatever. You can think all these times where there's all these people dead or dying or enslaved and they're all bound into these little cubbies. Eh. Maybe it came from this. It's deep, deep knowledge. It's interesting if you compare that to just like the traditional burial practices of many societies, which mm. was in like catacombs or yeah. deep recesses in the ground. Where, yeah, they, they stuck in the holes. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about it during the congregation prayer this week, which I already recorded, so I know what I'm going to say. Mm. It's kind of fun. But, uh, you know, burial practices, um, they are, I think they are left to our Christian liberty or freedom. But that doesn't mean that we, um, that we need to not think about what we're confessing with the burial and how we handle the burial. Um, I remember I, I must have said something in a sermon or something, and there were, we had um, someone who had been cremated. It was a tragic death, and they were just sitting on the mantle, and they had never been buried. And I must have said something in a, or, or something. And uh, they said, the family said, no, actually, we, he needs to be buried. We need to have, so we had a committal service and we actually buried, even though it was, you know, it, had, it was just ashes in a, in a thing, just ashes, right? Hmm. Um, which isn't perfect, I think. But we do want to think about, like, what are we confessing? In other words, what are we telling the, the, not, the what is not, not what the deceased is saying about themselves, but what are they saying to others about them, about what they believed, right? So one of the biggest opportunities you have as a Christian, to proclaim the gospel to those you love is in your death. So what you sing, what you hear read, what the pastor preaches, what's written in your obituary, how you're buried, the manner and means of that, um, all of that is, is a great way to confess. Of course, here the Lord's doing the opposite, isn't he? <laughs> By the burial of, of these pagan kings, he's actually showing um, that they... They, they are not going to receive the resurrection, are they? Well, at least not to eternal life. I mean, that's a whole other story, I suppose. That brings me to a, mm. a thought of what I've been caregiving. Yeah. This lady, I'd never been to her house before, so she said, well, I want to show you around my whole house. Yeah. It takes me to every room, opens every closet door, every cupboard almost. This is where I keep this bed. Mm. She gets it in her one bedroom. I think it was two bedrooms. One bedroom, and then there was her closet with all her clothes, and then the other closet, I forget what was in there, shoes or whatever. And back in the closet was another shelf, and she said, and there's my husband. <laughs> oh, okay. Isn't that interesting? Because she didn't say the ashes of my husband, no, but it was a, my husband. Oh, my dad was in the kitchen cabinet until Pastor said he shouldn't be married. Oh, <laughs> did that happen with you? Years. That happened with you too. Oh, okay. okay. No, there, I, no, I have another case. But I've never been that close to an urn, you know, without having it buried yeah. in the ground or something. Well, it's part of it is that we don't, as Christians, we, while we can distinguish between like body, soul, and spirit, we don't think of people separate as, each, as three separate parts. No, you're one, you're a person. 
And you, yes, you're composed of soul and spirit and body. You have breath, you have life, you have, and you can distinguish those things, but you can't separate them. So when you, when you see even the remains of someone who's been burnt um, to ash and the bones ground to powder, and they put that in with the ash, by the way, that's what they do with the bones because they don't burn. There's still chunks of bone in there. There's still chunks of bone, yeah. Um, you, you have to specifically, if you're going to do cremation, which I don't particularly like, but I don't like embalming either. So don't talk to me about what you should do. Um, no, I do have to talk to you about that. The, uh, <laughs> the third option is that you're dead and you put yourself in, a, put yourself in the casket and you put you in the ground yeah. and you don't do this like three weeks Are until. You you might never fight yeah. Is that allowed? I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. It is? Yeah. But not everywhere, not every county, da 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 yeah. da da. Yeah, you have to look at rules. His brother built his own Yeah, you can do that too. Use it as a book. They, get, they can make them as bookshelves, and then you can take out the shelf. The undertaker, you know, there was certain things that he had to do, and he told him what to do, and how to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it depends. Local, there's going to be local regs as to like whether you have to be in two. Sometimes you have to be double bagged if you're not embalmed. That's how it was in Indiana. Instead of having a single bag, they put you in a double bag. Or there's no bag if you're involved, but they put you in a double bag. You can't have a showing usually because if it's going to be a couple days later, um, no, you're not really viewable at that point. <laughs> not unless you really want to traumatize people, which you could do too. Uh, you're free. I mean, it smells bad. I'll just say that. I mean, it smells bad an hour later. It's, never mind. Yeah. Like, you can, you can wash the body. I mean, there's ways to... Anyway, read the Bible about this. It's in the Bible. Um, no, uh, yeah, oils too. Other fragrant things. My, um, I have a friend who, whose daughter died tragically, drug overdose. Um, probably the drugs were from her boyfriend. It's really a terrible thing. And, uh, you know, and she was young, teenager of some sort. I can't remember what age, 16, 17. So then, you know, and you're not prepared for that. You don't have like, been putting whole life policy or anything like that. So, you know, I had to go fund me and the whole thing to try to raise the money. And uh, talk to, there's some um, monks, Trappist monks somewhere here in Wisconsin that make caskets, like just wood caskets. Yeah, and so he reached out to them and uh, they ended up donating it to him, which was, which was very generous of them because of the situation. So he had this handmade wood casket from these monks. I don't know. That's how they, that's how they fund their monastery. You know, sometimes they do cheese or beer and wine or something. Yeah. All right. So there's options for that, but that's not the point of this. <laughs> all right. We got off the bean path. So Assyria, they're done, right? All of them slain, fallen by the sword who cost, and you'll note here the contrast. They're in the recesses in the, of the pit, in their grave, even though they cause terror in the land of the living. I think this is comforting to us as Christians. Despite how terrible they were, you know, with the destruction of the north and whatnot. Never mind that. In the end, they're effectively nothing. Their terror is brought to nothing. Compared to the terror of the Lord, actually. Right. So, um, we don't often discuss the fear of the Lord. It is in the explanation of the first commandment, right? We should fear, lo uh, fear love, and trust in God above all things. Right? That fear, we like to say, well, it means that we listen to him. Okay, that's true, um, but we also fear his wrath and don't want to do anything against him, <laughs> right? And, and apparently Assyria did not, is the point. All right, Elam, we don't know a lot about Elam, um, but it gets a pretty long um, soliloquy here, I think. Um, I gave you some notes about Elam on here somewhere. Where did I put it? Top of the second page, okay. Elam, one of the least well-known major civilizations in the ancient Near East. We haven't been able to translate. Um, there isn't like a Rosetta Stone or something. So they've, we have, they have tablets, cuneiform stuff. We can't read it. Don't know what it says. It seems to be um, founded around 3200 BC and then is conquered by Alexander the Great in 331. They do seem to be, they kind of stick around after that. And we know there's Elamites by the time of the New Testament because... It's one of the nations mentioned as coming to Pentecost. Elamites. Even though we don't know a lot about them, they do show up there. Uh, yeah, so we don't have major details about the Elamites. 
Apparently, according to Genesis 10, and 1 Chronicles 1 as well, uh, Elam appears as a son of Shem. So that's your connection. Along with Ashur, who become the Assyrians. So we have the Elamites, the Assyrians. Uh, or Pakashad, we don't know. Uh, Ludes become Lydians, and Arams become Aramaic, Aramites. Right? The most famous Elamite, the only one in the Bible, is... Uh, Chedorlaomer. I forgot the D. There's no D. I always remember his name because I think of Cheddar. Don't you think of Cheddar? You like Cheddar? Mm, nice Cheddar. Chedorlaomer, Genesis 14. He's one of the four kings that go and capture a lot. And then, remember, Abraham comes against him with the angel of the Lord. All right. Elam, according to Isaiah, is associated with archery, chariotry, and calvary. Jeremiah is a whole oracle against Elam, even though we don't know anything about them. Uh, it does seem, in Isaiah, it talks about Israelites going to Edom, and then Ezra mentions them returning. Um, and then, like I said, they're at Pentecost. So we have the Elamites. But a lot of what we see here is the same thing we heard against Assyria. Right? Maybe a little bit expanded, but not. Right? There's Elam with all her multitude, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, going down to the, un with the uncircumcised, to the uncircumcised. They cause terror in the land of the living, but now they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. You see the reversal? What you thought to be great was of, of glorious was of no glory at all. Which I think is, I, to me, I take comfort in that. Because we think of like all the terrible people and the tyrants in this world and all the terrible things they do. And how, and how they take glory in it even. They t they're proud of themselves. Look at what we accomplished. You know, we got hundreds of millions of people inoculated with some drug that we'd never tested. Um, and you're like, yeah, that, that's really glorious. I mean, not really, but they think it is. And I'm like, how about being baptized and give, being given the resurrection of the dead on the last day? How will your grand scheme look in, as a consequence of the resurrection of the body? Right? Which will actually be the, the, the everlasting detox. That's a good way to put that. I hadn't thought of that before. The eternal detox. Yeah. Uh, anyway, resurrection. So that, it's the same thing here with Elon. Whatever they did, they were a terror, and now they just bear their shame. And they have set their bed in the midst of the slain, and graves all around. All of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Though their terror was caused in the land of the living, now, yet they bear their shame and go down to the pit. Ethan, you need to set this to music, please. I don't know if anybody will publish it, but okay. <laughs> The song of Ezekiel. It'll be the song of Ezekiel. Yeah, you have to do it like a dirge, like a, like what's the one with the dash of children against the rocks, the psalm? Oh, yeah. oh. I had Cantor Hildebrand set that, give me a psalm tone for that. And it was, it just went down by a half step. Uh, and then it, we'd sing it again, but another we half step. That for psalm 22 one year. We did use it for Psalm 22 one year. Yeah, nice. All right, then we have Meshach and Tubal. Um, these are Anatolian nations. Where's Anatolia? Anybody know? I wrote that down. I looked it up. I can't remember now. What? I've heard that name. Yeah, it's, it's a whole group of places up to the north. north. North of Israel. Nobody knows where Anatolia is? Anatolia. Oh, there's an Anatolian shepherd dog. Leah. All right, let's see what happens. Who knows what's going to come up. Oh, look at that. Asia Minor. Why don't we just call it Asia Minor? Modern day Turkey, along with there it is. See it? Yeah, so way up north. So that's, that's where these places are. Now you know. Yeah. So uh, who are they? Meshach and Tubal. There's others. Yeah, I actually had a note which sent me back to Genesis chapter 10. Uh, Meshach hmm. and Tubal are actually both sons of Jacob. Yes, they were. That's correct. Uh, and then we're going to hear about these places again later on, or these people or places, either way, it doesn't matter. Just like Pharaoh or Egypt, what's the difference, right? Um, in chapter 35, because they're going to be finally destroyed there. So we're a little bit ahead of the, we're, we're prophesying ahead, but we're going to come back and have their actual destruction later on. Again, same thing, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they cause terror in the land of the living, they don't lie with the mighty who are fallen, Right? They've gone down to hell with their weapons of war, laid their swords under their heads. Oh, that's a nice pillow. But their iniquities will be on their bones. Ooh. Because all the terror of the mighty in the land of the living, yes, you shall be broken. 
and lie with those slain by the sword. So you have the same idea again. You can hear all the kind of refrains here, the re repetition. Yeah, there's a, seems to be a little more here with Meshet and Tubal. Mm -hmm. It does seem like it's like we've got Assyria, and then it goes steps up a notch with Elam, and then it steps up a notch again. It gets, keeps getting expand, more expansive. Yeah, but even, even in hell, they, they do not lie with the, they don't, they don't have a uh, militaristic. Yeah, with, like, they, they do not get the luxury suite of hell. They're, they're in the, uh, the budget rooms. <laughs> they don't get to lie with the mighty. What? Well, I mean, like I said, there's different levels, right? That's fine. And then Edom. Now Edom, of course, this is an ancient enemy, even more ancient than Assyria. Remember who was Edom named after? Edom means red. Who do we call her? Who's red? Yes. Esau. Edom yeah. is uh, what was the stew that he ate. It was the stew that he ate was red, yeah. Yeah, but I like to call him Red, you know, like um, from that 70s show, you know. It's the old name you call people. Just call him Red instead of calling him Esau. Um, but here's the Edomites. Her kings and all her princes, they've been a, they, I mean, we have lots of stuff. I didn't give you any citations. There's so much, so many stories, so many wars with the Edomites. All of it, they're always causing problems. That, that ancient Jacob and Esau thing, right? Brothers, uh, what do we call that? Hatfields and McCoys, right? North and the South. I was listening about the Civil War. Same story. Who, despite their might, are laid beside those slain by the sword. They shall lie with the uncircumcised, go down with those of the pit. Their princes of the North. Oh, also with them, the Sidonians. Uh, Sidon. That's Tyre and Sidon. We talked about that, right? So now we got the Tyre people, too. We have gone down with the slain in shame and terror, which they've caused by their might. They lie with the uncircumcised. Da, 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 da. We've heard that before. And then... Adios. Bye. Pharaoh will see them and be comforted over all his multitude. Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword because, like I said, here we are with everybody else. We got what we deserved. I guess there's this kind of comfort to that, isn't there? Eternal fire, perdition, gnashing, weeping of teeth, fire. I already said fire. Fire? More fire? <laughs> I fell into the burning ring of fire. Okay, different song. For I have caused my terror in the land of the living. Notice here, who's caused the terror now? Who's talking here? Yeah. yeah. So, like I said, what they gloried in had no glory at all. The terror that they imposed, God's terror is far worse. All right? So they're getting um, exactly what, basically, with what measure they gave, they received. <laughs> Actually, more than what they gave, probably, right? God's terror is even more. So what Jesus talks about the measure that you use. He's talking about forgiveness. With how you forgive, of course, is how you'll be forgiven. The two go together. Right? If you refuse to forgive your brother, then of course, fine. God will say, then you, you pay back, you pay the penalty. You don't want that. <laughs> no, so forgive, right? As the Lord has forgiven you. Uh, and he will be placed, okay, we talked about this, with the slain by the sword. Pharaoh and all his multitude says the Lord God. Finally, all the Gentile nations have been judged. We had, this started back in what, chapter 28? So we've had, and this is 32, so we've had five chapters of judgment against the Gentiles. Before that, judgment against everybody else. Everybody's been judged, and it's time for, since everybody's dead, basically, it's time for some resurrection. But you're going to have to wait a couple weeks for that. Or you can read ahead if you want, chapter 32, which is beautiful, with the watchman. 33, sorry, 33. Okay. Oh, do you want the gospel? Sorry. Finally, God himself exercises a terror that trumps and finally overwhelms all human terrors. The terrors of God's accusations of his law are necessary to drive the sinner to repentance. Fear of God's judgment is a prerequisite to living in faith or to receiving in faith the consolation of the gospel that Christ on our behalf won for us full pardon, received through faith in him. God must overcome death by entering into death himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, triumphing over it through his resurrection from the dead. Each believer overcomes the fear of death and all the subsidiary terrors of this fallen world only by being baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, reminds us of the it is finished of Jesus. Which word would you rather have? 
Would you like this to be the last word you hear from God or Christ's word from the cross where all the terrors were meted out on him and it is finished, you see. So that's the problem ultimately with all these nations is there is a means of escape, but they've, they refuse to believe and receive it, which is the promised Messiah. Okay, that's it. You can go away now. Or Lord be with you or thank you. Yeah, enjoy your time. Yeah, should be fun. <laughs>